we have to remember that Baba said nothing is serious except the lack of love for God. So when you use the word catastrophe, that's from your point of view. From Baba's point of view, from God's point of view, the only catastrophe is that we don't love God enough. And Baba would say that in many ways to us. And he would always say, hold on to my daman. And people who don't know what the word daman means, it is the hem of his garment. And he actually at times would have someone who was kneeling before him or he'd call them to him and he would take their hand and put it onto his garment hem, you know, and hold their hand onto his own daman. And even with two hands, say, hold on with two hands, which means probably that person had to have a double whammy, as we say. And it was interesting that I watched two people get the double hand treatment from Baba, and those two people had difficulties. They actually had difficulties uh, with mental uh, problems, with kind of a mental breakdown type of problem in, in years to come. And they went through it and held on to Baba. So that was a little bit of uh, interesting byplay that Baba actually showed us how to hold on to his daman. And actually, one, we're all in the same boat now. You know, in the Song of the New Life, it says we're all sailing in the same boat now. <laughs> the disciples, the mandali, the beginners, the old-time lovers, and maybe dozens of people out there who uh, are not even born yet will be in the same boat of not having Baba physically present, but being asked to hold on to his daman. So you're asking, what does that mean? And of course it means the obvious thing to focus on him as the God-man, the Christ, the divine friend, or however you want to look on Baba. Baba said, whatever you think I am, say that. You know, if you think I'm the Antichrist, <laughs> and there are some people who hold on to the Antichrist, but uh, basically it is to stay in touch, on, in focus with Baba. Now how that turns out for you as an individual in your psyche, of course, depends on where you are and who you are and how much work you can do on yourself to clear the channel for Baba to reach through to you, just like he took his hand and put their hand on his dom and he does something and you do something. You do something too. It's not just you or just him. It's like taking steps toward Baba. Baba says, if you take one step toward me, I take 12 steps toward you. <laughs> I just think what that means because that means basically what God did in this avataric age was the 12 steps of God, whatever, from the highest of the high to get born in a, a womb, to go through childhood, to be veiled in his childhood and be unveiled with all that suffering, with the universe coming down on his shoulders. We know that it took seven years for Baba to uh, have his consciousness balance, the creation consciousness with God consciousness. So that was a tremendous step or two that God takes to come down and be a human being. Baba says somewhere that what is perfection? It is being God as man and man as God. It's not God alone or man alone. It's, it's the two together that is the perfected thing in the universe. And that's very important because we have a lot of theology, a lot of groups that think of God only in the abstract, only as the remote father or the remote void or absolute and here's God taking human form, and he's done it more than once. Of course, the Orthodox and different groups don't agree with that, but I think Bob has made a tremendous breakthrough in his discourses on the Avatar for the mind of today and tomorrow 
a great ecumenical thing that this avatar has always been the same avatar, the one and the same. And in a way, once we get rid of the religious bigotry and confusion about that, it's going to bring everyone together so much more. That you worship Jesus, I worship Krishna, the other one looks up to Buddha, it's all going to mold together, meld together, and it will make it easier in a way for us to be close to Baba because whatever faith or group that we're born into in the future I see they will be flowing toward the God-man in all his incarnations. I mean it adds a great deal of glory and wonder to feel that Baba not only was Meher Baba but he was Buddha, he was Jesus, he was Krishna, he was Ram, but the Zoroastrians if you ever spoken to a Zoroastrian there they're into Zoroaster, and he's the oldest one of all. And, you know, there's this fire of devotion. You can imagine, like, all the rivers of devotion flowing toward this one avatar. Give a tremendous push to the world and uh, make it easier for each one. Of course, it's going to be a lot easier and harder, in a sense, in the future. Easier in the fact that great masses of people will have accepted Baba and since we are mass-minded great numbers of people go only by what other people are doing and saying they'll flow toward Baba. It'll be harder perhaps to be more intimately uh, close to Baba in your thoughts because you'll be so molded by what people tell you, by history, by uh, interpretations which are already starting <laughs> you know, the philosophy of Mayor Baba and so forth. It's like the perfume of the rose has dissipated a little. And the real rose, the petals have gone. So now you're looking at the form of the rose. For some people that's very easy, much easier than a living Christ. I had a friend who was a little Jewish girl who turned Catholic, a very devout Catholic, and we offered to have her meet Mayor Baba. And she said, I wouldn't come even if I thought he was the Christ. And I said, why? And she said, it's, it's too much of a challenge. I, I couldn't handle it. That's my words for it. I don't remember the exact word. But it's like the living Christ is too much. And I've talked to many people in different faiths, and that is basically true. It's too much for them to sit in the living room with a living Christ. We've invited, we did invite many leading lights of the religious world of, of, for example, 56 when Baba was here. And none of them had the energy, the curiosity, the spunk or spark to just come. Whatever they would have thought of Mayor Baba, they just didn't have that jump, that spark to come and see for themselves. But I could imagine them, you know, 700 years from now, giving long lectures and talks and TV or whatever is going to be the media then on uh, the, the Christ, you know. For, uh, Billy Graham is a good example. He's still going around. He's a wonderful man, evangelist. He's talking about the, the second coming of Christ. Are you ready? Are you going to repent? But when he was invited to meet the second coming, he just would have none of it. So. To stay in touch with Baba, you have to have a little spark in the heart. And really, you can't get that spark except from Baba, I suppose, by grace. On the other hand, you can keep your mind open. You can keep the intellectual windows open. I think that's very important. I was very lucky to be born in a family like that, where a liberal-mindedness was you know, we just took it in with our kids' oatmeal. <laughs> it was not a bigoted family. And that's great, and I think that's important to keep your mind open just from the intellectual level. Not to say like Reinhold Niebuhr said to me, Christ will come at the end of history. And I said, but Dr. Niebuhr, that's the end of a cycle. It isn't the end of, of the whole shebang. It's not Michael. Angelo's last judgment is <laughs> the end of a cycle and he's here again. He said, oh, I've devoted my whole life to this. 
and I can't change now. You see, his intellectual windows were closed, and I don't care who he was or how great, that's, that was the answer. He couldn't step across, you know, about ten blocks to go just see for himself. And we have to think about that in the future. But to, for the individual to keep hold of Baba's Dhamma, it, it is love that keeps you close to Baba. It's like Baba gave the example of the kite. He said, it doesn't matter what kind of glue, and he mentioned, you know, four-letter words, <laughs> what kind of glue you use to uh, keep the string on the kite. <clears throat> but as long as you keep hold of it, uh, it, that's what you need to do. So it doesn't matter if you're stuck to Baba to the worst motive in the world. Maybe you want to make a million bucks or something, <laughs> let's say the worst. Uh, if you come to Baba for that even, or you come for health or a child or to calm your mind down or, you know, some outward motive, that's okay because Baba accepts all those sin scares and then he throws his love at you. But of course the highest glue is love. And I say in the ultimate, it is His grace. His grace. It's the seed of love that He's thrown down. And who knows how many seeds He's thrown down in His avataric manifestation. That is an incredible uh, crop that we really don't know anything about. We see it now in our generation, or your generation, you youngsters. <laughs> but it's like He sowed, like a real good gardener would sow different weeks, you know, you sow the seeds every week so that later on you have different crops. And I think that's what Baba's done with humanity. Right now he has a small group. The Baba world is very small. And I don't think anything about those people who don't want to hear about him. Because maybe they'll be born again in the hundred years and their seed will start to flower. And I think that's what the Avatar has done. He's created waves of people. and when someone comes to me and feels real sad that they didn't meet Baba in the body, I said, but don't you see, he would have to have waves of lovers. He couldn't have everybody there all in the same time slot. He has to have people now in the body who love him. And then they'll have to have children, your children or your grandchildren, that love him and so on. And with reincarnation, which, of course, Baba has explained very carefully. You could meet Baba in the body, and then a uh, hundred years from now reincarnate again, and have very strong feelings for Baba. So those seeds keep rotating, so forth, you know. And let's face it, the creation is an elitist uh, process. It's a pyramid. There are people at the top and people at the bottom in the sense of continuous creativity from God. In other words, he's always creating new souls. They have to go through the whole process. They come into human incarnation. At that point, they're not ready for a spiritual awakening. But there are people further on who are, and those further on and further on. And eventually everybody gets to the goal. That's why I was always attracted to Eastern thought. It's so hopeful. It's so positive. There's no one who's not going to make it. No one who can be despised or damned to hell or thrown out or... And I don't think anybody ever drops Baba's Dhamma either. Because where can you drop it to? <laughs> if God is you and Baba is you, then you're, quote, dropping him or fading away is going to be only temporary. In fact, Bobby used, I think, somewhere in the discourse, as the uh, simile of a fisherman. You know, he might catch the biggest fish, but the biggest fish has to have the biggest line. You know, you could catch a minnow in one minute and throw it in the basket, you know, little simple souls like me. But he goes after some big fish like Gabriel Pascal or who knows. He had to give him a long rope, <laughs> a long line. It kind of plays you, you know, you go away and then you come back and you go away. And I see that with certain people who, quote, have left Baba. I think the basic thing 
to hold on to bhava is the love, keep the love going. And the intellectual windows open, never get die hard even about bhava or bhava's teachings. <laughs> and then don't get lazy, don't get bored. Indifference is the curse of the spiritual path. I see more people have left, quote, left bhava, or bhava groups or whatever you want to call them, just simply through indifference, through lack of energy of working on themselves or moving on. They just get into a stasis. And of course that's maya, it's creating ruts, getting into ruts. And Baba gives us many hints on how to break those ruts. A lot of things have been suggested. I don't, you know, those... You can read about them in The Path of Love. This is a new edition of the book that we formed from all the wonderful discourses and messages Baba gave to the Awakener through the years. Baba gives the 12 ways of realizing me and how to obtain his grace. That was in the dis dissertation on love. Shall I read a little bit of that? Dissertation on love. One of my favorite discourses, Baba says, what is love? To give and never to ask. What leads to this love? Grace. What leads to this grace? Grace is not cheaply bought. It is gained by being always ready to serve and reluctant to be served. There are many points which lead to this grace. Wishing well for others at the cost of oneself. Never backbiting. Tolerance supreme. Trying not to worry. Trying not to worry is almost impossible, so try. I relate to that one particularly. <laughs> Thinking more of the good points in others and less of their bad points. What leads to this grace? Doing all of the above. If you do one of these things perfectly, the rest must follow. Then grace descends. Have love, and when you have love, the union with the beloved is certain. That last sentence has always been my favorite. If you have love, then you will become one with the beloved. You can't fail. You can't drop the Dhamma. The, the Dhamma is love. That's all I can say. I don't know whether that answers your question. Now, someone outside the Baba group may say, this man's a monomaniac. He wants you to focus on his picture, uh, to say his name constantly, to write his name constantly, uh, to concentrate on his human personality, all of that. And uh, why? Why? It's because when the God-man manifests this gross body even, uh, it's a link with God. So to focus on him even as, as a body, as, you know, his picture, his beauty, uh, makes a link. And the, the main thing of all spiritual disciplines, you have to understand metaphysically how it works, Every, if everything is vibration and you have negative vibrations coming up like steam from a bog of the past, the negative fumes, and you don't even know what past they're coming from, but there's noxious fumes that make you depressed, angry, um, resentful, uh, you know, low self-image, that's the big pop word now. All of that, you don't know where it's coming from. How do you destroy that? You have to it's vibrations there. So you have to sock it with positive vibrations. And that's the whole game of saying mantras, of saying affirmations, positive thoughts, positive visual images, and so forth. Now you transfer all that uh, knowledge and now you do the positive Baba thought, the positive Baba mantra, his name, his picture, uh, any message he may have given you or given others that you like and reading his books, uh, saying the prayers. In other words, you create the vibration that destroys the other vibration. You don't fight the other vibration. That, that's a very good psychological principle that a really trained psychologist will give you and also Baba gives you. You don't argue with that. You simply leave it out and fill it up with something positive. You know. 
And he said, don't mind thoughts. They come and go. Don't be shocked that you have these thoughts. Don't be shocked that you have terrible thoughts or even terrible dreams, like I had the dream of, of trying to kill my father. <laughs> okay, I'm not upset by that, except, you know, when I wake up the first moment. Uh, that's the hatred of the father, which is classic. So I just, okay, all right, now I'm going to replace it with the love of Mayor Baba, my real father. And that actually happened to me. I'm sitting in Ivy's living room, and there comes my father in to meet Baba. And all that, you know, that dislike of him and what he did and all that came up. And plus the love too, you know, it's nothing so one-sided. And instantly my heart said to Baba, Baba, I don't want any more karma with that man. I just don't want any more karma with that man. Because I knew the karma through many lives. Okay, and so Baba turned and he smiled at me. And my father, meanwhile, is coming towards Baba. He's, he's babbling, oh, mate, Mr. Arani, we're so glad to welcome you to New York. You know, he's playing this Grover Whalen role. And then his, he, he sort of dies down, and Bob is looking at him. And um, so I'm saying, Baba, you're my real father. This is all silent, but Baba heard it. Okay. So you transplant your love or hate for the father to the, the love for Baba. And uh, the disappointment in your romance, you're going to hate women or something, you know, or men, whatever. Uh, transfer that to Baba. Make Baba your beloved. You see, you don't stop fighting with the past or that person out there uh, or, or something in you. You just get rid of it by filling it up with a positive with a with positive and you can make this happen even just simply by repeating something which seems very mechanical and some people don't resent that you know they say it's mechanical like to say Baba's name or to repeat the prayers I've had people in my living room get very angry why are you saying the prayers it's very mechanical blah 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 and I'm not coming here anymore if you say the prayers <laughs> This man was very angry with me for saying the mass. We all said the mass is pay. I said, you don't have to say it. Well, that ostracizes me. It's very obvious you're ostracized. I said, well, then you don't have to come here. You know, do what you want. You're free. We're going to say the prayer. He comes the next time, Monday night, and I didn't say the prayers. He goes home. He comes again the next Monday night, and I didn't say the prayers. The third Monday comes again. And he drove all the way from Riverside two hours each time. He said, where are the prayers? We're not saying the prayers. <laughs> he wanted the prayers. <laughs> he was just, uh, his, his whole training, he was Jewish, and, and you know, they're so anti-Christianity prayers and stuff. I don't know, although the Jews pray every hour of their lives, these Hasidic Jews, I don't know. Anyway, he was against prayer. But suddenly he realized that something was missing by saying, it's funny how people send scares get, uh, you know, uh, your, your training and background may make you resent some of these things. Like, I used to hate hearing the rosary babbled over and over again, you know, almost meaning, meaninglessly. But now I understand, you know, uh, we may sound the same thing, sound like the same thing, saying Baba's prayer over and over again. But it destroys the negativity. The main thing Baba has emphasized over and over again that outside of meeting him body to body in the flesh to go and visit him in the tomb, that is to take the darshan in the tomb, is very critical because the power is there. The powerhouse is there. He actually, I think, uses those words that after he's gone, that will be the place. For example, why do you come to Baba at all? It, it's to transform your life, to surrender to him, to, to get established on the path. Instead of being this little hawa, as the God speaks call it, this little hawa, trailing around trying to find the entrance of the path, he's going to put you on the path. Start right there. Or as Bao says, Bob has cut the door in the first plane. Okay, how do you get to that contact point? The tomb. I don't care whether you sit on your mountain here and you feel bliss and you feel Baba. Or, I think that when 
Also, if one's hale and hearty and has a few bucks somehow, you must go to the tomb. I don't accept any excuse at all. <laughs> I really don't. It, it, it's just a lack of understanding. If I was not in the body, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the tomb. You know, and this will be true for the next, until he comes again. And Baba would say, like he said to Pir Vilayat Khan, let's leave the Pir out, Vilayat Khan, he said, don't go to the tomb of Muhammad and Chisti, who was a perfect master, because what you'll find there, you know, is here. And he would say that in more or less terms to all of us, you know. Murshid just wanted to go to the Taj Mahal at 62. He begged Baba to go, although Baba said, go straight home. No, I want to go see the Taj Mahal. Baba says, the Taj Mahal is here. You know, where, where are you going to go? <laughs> so, um, it's, it's very, very true that Baba's emphasized the pilgrimage to the tomb. And of course, right now, one is very lucky to meet the Mandalay. Do you know what privilege that is? It's not going to be lasting more than another ten years or so. They'll be gone. So you're very foolish if you sit around and you're tush and don't go. You know? Well, one of the privileges of being with Baba was to meet his Mandalay, <clears throat> and especially his women Mandalay, and especially Mehera his feminine counterpart, as the word is used, similar to Radha, as she was to Krishna, Sita to Ram, and Mary to Jesus. I don't remember the name of Muhammad's <laughs> wife, Khalifa, I've heard, maybe. The avatar always has his feminine counterpart. Baba said she was the purest soul in the universe. And I don't think Baba speaks lightly that you feel around her is definitely true. There's something extraordinary about her. The depth of her love for Baba, the total focus on Baba, the tenderness, the whole human range of love without any taint of lust or selfish motivation is, is just a, a wonderful paradigm for all of us, especially women. I thought I might mention how Baba handled women. When you were alone with Baba and the women, he was different. He was, you know, he was with us as the lover, the beloved, the father, the brother, which was a little different. In some ways he was gentler, uh, perhaps. Anyway, you felt being a woman, very, very privileged to be there with him. And of course, in a sense, to look at Baba as the beloved is a little easier for women because it's a natural thing. And uh, he played up to that a little in very special little ways, you know. One time he tapped his cheek and uh, that was for me to come over and give him a kiss. <laughs> You know, or he'd hold your hand, take, reach out and warmly take your hand in a special way. It was very loving, very, those little touches, Baba, as the human being, the human side of God. I think we all hope to keep that fragrance of, of you know, of Baba as a human being with human affections. Like he said, he loves everyone equally, but some are his favorite toys, that was a word I like because I'm a toy designer. <laughs> Favorites to be accompanying him or to to relax him on his pressure of his universal work. <clears throat> and I always felt a very close bond to Baba's Mira, and Baba seemed to foster that. There were little ways that he did that. I know he had uh, her in seclusion or she was in seclusion for so many years. And I was one of the first people allowed to write to her. Uh, we started the family letters writing to her in 56. The, the five of us, Baba's five <laughs> girls. And uh, I don't know, we had a special, I had a special 
feeling for her. And then on the beach in 52, Baba reached out his hand and gave me the shell and said, give it to Mira. Now that was when I heard his voice inwardly. And in many ways that was a link for me from Baba to Mira. You know, there was something special there. I felt that Baba had connected me with Mira in special ways. Maybe, who knows, in some other life we were connected. And she felt that way too. She's always shown a real loving interest in me. Just recently, you know, I've been able to get these beautiful letters from her and so on. She has that motherly quality and yet that childish quality, even a little bit of uh, the woman who's so beautiful and, uh, you know, she's got all the feminine best qualities <laughs> rolled up and it shows in her manner, her beauty and it's amazing how from that strict seclusion which was really broken here in America from the accident when the doctors had to take care of her and all she has flowered now even in her grief which was so intense nobody could imagine that grief of living after Baba's gone she has come out of that and reached out to all these people who come to Meherazad in such a loving way broken her seclusion like, like a rose opening I always think and that's a fantastic thing you know psychologically in a way and I feel she shows that in our age Baba is liberating women from their age-old minority role, <laughs> uh, depressed role, dependent role, and so forth. I think that the fact that she survived Baba indicates that it's very important. He, the, you know, his work centers now, in a sense, on the women in India as much as anything. Mayor is the key figure, and Mani's the head of the trust, and Gore is in charge of the clinic. The women are functioning there in amazing ways. Uh, Baba's women uh, are sort of role models, it's sort of a cliche word, but for women in their emergence in this age. And as we said, America's in the vanguard, and Baba said his work in the West, which has been major in America, has been done through women. So the, what, the role of women is very important and Baba has said that in this age we have to transfer from reason to intuition. At the time of Christ he said we move from uh, instinct to reason. And of course in a female body, a female incarnation, it's easier to use the intuition, the, the psychic structure, the setup is that way that you can function better intuitively as a woman. You have maybe more permissiveness from society and also whatever it is about the psyche, the balance, the male-female balance, you have more chance to be intuitive. Not that men aren't intuitive, but it, it was easier certainly in the 20s and the 30s when Baba gathered his first Western disciples. Uh, so many of them were women. And those women played critical roles, both in England and America, and France a little bit. And he trusted his work to these women. Baba said, women in the West right then or now are more spiritual than the men. The men in the East are more spiritual than the women. Although we trade incarnations, you know, we move back and forth, which I thought was always interesting from the psychology point of view where, uh, for instance, Jung always says, you know, we shouldn't get involved in Eastern um, ideas because it's so powerful, the conditioning, and we shouldn't try to imitate Eastern spirituality. Okay, I don't agree with that in a sense because now we travel in incarnations back and forth, and especially now through the media, through travel, <clears throat> we're just melding these two cultures very, very rapidly. 
And so the intuitive women in the West, you know, have, are going to have as much influence as the spiritual men in the East, you know. And that's been happening. It has been true ever since the 30s. Uh, not putting down the men, but uh, the role has been very, very much laid onto the onto the women. Elizabeth founded the center, and Adelia upheld the Baba's work in London uh, with others. Margaret has done a tremendous job, Margaret Crask, in the ballet world, and um, the three women, Nadine, Elizabeth, and Irina, really started Baba work so much again in the West, in New York, and later in Myrtle Beach. And it spread out from there. Their contacts were very fruitful. The Sufis, Sufis incorporated, no, Sufis reoriented <laughs> uh, through Ivy Deuce, Rabia Martin. Also women uh, contacted through Narina's work. Rabia Martin came and lived with us for a year before she decided Baba was the Kutub. <laughs> and then she made Murshida, Deuce Murshida, who carried on. And these women, I had a chance to know them very well. And as I say, also Mera is the inspiration. It's like a, a world of women's emergence as figures. And you notice that Baba except for a few, keeping them in the ashram with him, they always were sent back into the world. They were sent back into the world to function in the world. Again, to be in the world, but not of it. And he also encouraged their careers, their independence, and their talent, like Margaret going on with her dancing. And... Narina played this amazing role, of course, on the stage at one time. And Elizabeth kept in her business world, which was very, very helpful in founding the center. I don't think anybody without a good solid background <laughs> in business could have handled it. And so forth. There, there's, there's Agnes and Mayor Mount, whatever's going to happen to that. It's very interesting, even the, the work I did here in Los Angeles, I never had any strong male help. I had to do it myself, basically, for a long time. And now we have a crop of, of youngsters, both girls and boys, but uh, it was essentially my, my push that got it started. And um, previous to that, Mrs. Fuchs had held the fort a bit here in Hollywood. It's interesting. And then Jean Angel way back in the 30s with Malcolm, that's true, but her book was very critical. I still hear how people heard of Baba first through her book Avatar, the first biography of Baba, and uh, her influence through the book, perhaps not so much through her own appearance, but uh, through the book certainly she made a dent. <laughs> people still think of her book as a little too feminine, but I like it. I think it has the heart quality. You see, it's a little easier in this materialistic age to be a woman and have the heart quality. But now Baba has brought us forward as a group. Uh, women are emerging. We have the feminist movement, of course, which gets a little too far, uh, perhaps. But the essence of it is very true, very important, and I think spurred on by the avatar because we're half of the population, we're not a minority window. <laughs> we are half of the population. And to have it kept in dependence and minority status and either financial or any other way, creativity or anything, is, is not going to suit the New Age. We, if you have to get the balance between the heart and the head, then obviously you have to get the balance through also the male-female, in your psyche and also in society. And we have to have that equal equality. And it's for our further growth. Just as is inwardly we have to balance male-female, we have to balance our work in the world, our position in the world, and 
this, I think Bob is giving it a tremendous push. It has its fallout areas, you know. But so many women, for example, have come to me and said, well, I've had all these inner experiences. Some of them are psychic, some of them are cults. If you don't know the difference, you should study Baba. And some of them are mystical. They have really been very open to this type of thing. And that's part of their danger and their development. That's why I'm, I'm sort of a case A. <laughs> I know people ask me to do my biography, but it, it's like you have to go through the whole thing, the whole development. Uh, as a feminine person, I was laughed at and criticized for having experiences. I was put down because I wasn't, you know, a, a man. I remember one man, <clears throat> boy at that time, I said, oh, you'll never be a philosopher, Phyllis. You're a woman. <laughs> that really got me angry <laughs> because I was majoring in philosophy. You know, it's like no woman could have the IQ or the temperament to be a great philosopher or even a good philosopher. <laughs> but I think all well, that's changing very rapidly because once you give opportunity to a human soul they're going to make use of it and break down all the old cliches and uh, it puts a lot of strain on uh, relationships between men and women as we said because if you are changing as a woman then the man has to accept that and change with you or he's you know going to have great dif you both have great difficulties and in uh, caring for each other and communicating, you know. And you can almost look at the world as divided, east and west, <clears throat> right brain, left brain. Uh, those, those have to come together. They have to balance. The cultures have to balance. The so-called intuitive, introverted, passive east, you know, that's sort of the cliché they use, Spiritual East now has to meld with a materialistic, go-getting, uh, rational, scientific West. In my early days, I met so many Indians who were students over here, and they had no use for their own country. They thought their religion had stifled it, and they were only interested in science. You meet that kind of Indian uh, a lot, and the government was very, very much like that except for a few rare souls. And it's true, they have to use a modern scientific knowledge to help India in this ghastly poverty. And the same in China, they have to catch up with the technology and all that. So the whole balance is coming. But now we have a tremendous input, for example, in psychology from, from women. I won't quote all these women writers in psychology, but they have done a great deal of input on uh, the role of women. There's a continual outflow of books and papers and whatnot on emerging womanhood. And to get back to how Baba helped that along, I'll, I'll, I'll tell about my poetry. I've always written poetry, and um, I had a book of poems, maybe I did tell this before, but I had it in my suitcase to show to Baba and I forgot all about it and the happiness of being with him. And then Baba said one day, where's your poetry? So I, I brought the book and he kept it at his feet on the gaudy. And then a couple of days later he'd say, he picked it up and put his finger in it and gestured. He didn't say that it should be read and Monty read this poem three times. He did put his finger in and choose three poems. I don't remember the last two, but the first one, the essence of it was, I know God is infinite, impersonal, but I want always to have between me and that aspect of God, the personal aspect of the beloved, the face of the beloved. I'm using my prose now, not my poetry. And Baba gave this very beautiful smile to me, which, you know, his full beauty of his face. This was in 52, before the accident, before that kind of spoiled his 
uh, you know, he had broke the nose and the jaw and all. So he graciously encouraged my poetry. And yet, strangely enough, for years after that, I didn't write anything. And then I began writing again, and it's all dedicated to Bob. I hope to publish it soon. Uh, maybe Vanity Publishing, but <laughs> it's all for Baba. But he wanted me to use the talent I had or to develop it, not saying I'm going to be a great poet, but whatever talent you have, he encouraged. And he did with, with uh, other women to not be just an adjunct to some male. You know, that role was broken. Um, really, in some cases, rather radically, <laughs> but uh, you can be a helpmate, you can be a, a partner on the path, but that idea that, you know, we have to be just subdominant to the male, even though maybe in another life we're going to be male ourselves, but the, the, the universal pattern of that is, is certainly crashing all around us. People ask me, what did you ask Baba? I didn't ask him for anything. I was too absorbed in, in the joy of being with him, and I actually just could not think of, you know, immediate needs or even emotional needs or anything. And I was lucky in that respect, because Baba looked at me and he said, those who ask for nothing get everything. <laughs> and, but. Of course, the needs were there, the wants were there, and what he did was bring them up out of my subconscious. Uh, looking back on myself in those days, I can see I wasn't as aggressive as I am now. Assertive. <laughs> Baba had to bring out that side of myself. Maybe I don't seem to you that way now, but I was very shy and non-assertive. I'd had very domineering, um, well, not domineering, but very strong personalities for parents. And then the Mondali that I stayed with, like Noreen and Elizabeth, not so much Nadine, they're the very powerful personality. You know, kind of repressive in some aspects, not too concerned with your needs. And so Baba worked on that, and he brought me out of, the, out of uh, my shell, so to speak. So now I'm real assertive, as you all notice. <laughs> That's good. It's like bringing yourself to a balance. However, asking for Baba things, it's a very delicate point. People want a response from God, and God wants to respond, but there has to be some growth, some moving ahead, uh, which means getting rid of wants. So how he handles your want or your need is, is very interesting. Some people, he just gives that thing that they want so much, and they get it, and then they're sorry. <laughs> there are many stories about that. You can look in the Baba literature. But uh, people would ask Baba about their career, young people especially. And Baba, I was, was interested in this later on more. He would say, what do you want to do? Someone, a young person would say, you know, what should I do, Baba? Big question. And he said, what do you want to do? And then they'd say, I want to be a dancer, I want to be a doctor, I want to be this or that. And then Baba would say, do it. Do it wholeheartedly and think of me while you're doing it. And looking back on the psychology of that, he didn't say, oh, you'll make a lousy doctor or a lousy dancer or, or something. No, you have to fulfill yourself. And especially as a woman, I think that today is so important. That you must fulfill your talents and your... Uh, abilities in this Western world. I don't know what he told Easterners. I'm just speaking mostly about Westerners. He wants you to be creative with yourself and your life. It's not like today is like the medieval days where you gave up everything and shut yourself up or go up into Nepal and sit on the mountaintop like some hippie people wanted to do. No, go back in life, uh, study, finish your college, uh, take care of your family, don't abandon them. And uh, I think Baba emphasizes that for Western life. He says, in the West, renunciation should be inward, uh, inward detachment. 
in other words you can do all these things you can be you know Peter Townsend up there on the stage but be detached from it and of course that's I think that's a lot tougher I've been reading Thomas Merton lately and you know he was my actually almost contemporary and we had mutual friends at Columbia he became a Catholic Trappist monk joining a silent order <laughs> Just about the exact time when I turned toward Baba. So he became a Catholic, I became a Baba lover. And toward the end of his life, he started studying Eastern thought and meditation. He was searching in India to meet a guru, actually, when he died over there. And his writings have influenced a great, great many people. And it's very interesting because he took this monastic path and he was not too satisfied with it at the end of his life. Um, finding that he wasn't in relation enough to the world as it is out there. And I, if you watch what Baba did with Eastern and Western disciples, he mixed them together first of all. He traveled a great deal around the world with these mixed groups. And although he treated his intimate monolith very specially, but all the rest of them that had those chances to be with Baba, he would keep them with him for a while and then put them back in the world, in their careers, in their families, their lifestyle, and told them to just concentrate on him inwardly and to go on with their life. And I think that to me has always been the core of Baba's way of dealing with us today, in today's world, the, the path. Although, as you know, Baba says, the path follows you. <laughs> and in a sense, I always think of that. Give the example of, you know, when you walk on the beach, it's nice, beautiful, unmarked sand. And you walk forward on it, and you create the path. Someone behind you can follow your footsteps. And that's what I literally did with Baba. I followed his footsteps on the path of, uh, of pure sand there at Myrtle Beach. <laughs> So, following the avatar, you keep your eye on the central point of God as man, the God-man, and then the path just unfolds. It's not like other disciplines, other gurus, whatever. Even other perfect masters, they, they have a different way of working with you. They keep you in an ashram or something. Or they give you a lot of uh, exercises and uh, controls and, you know, all that kind of thing. Bob is very free. I thought of that the other day, of myself even. I'm, here I've, I've, I saw Bob in the 50s, last time in 62, and since then, uh, nobody has told Phyllis what to do or where to go or how to behave or uh, how to follow him or how to do his work. I had to totally come out of myself. And uh, although the Mondali give you a stroke now and then, I mean, they don't tell you or interfere or, you know, anything on that, unless you c cross real bad lines. But uh, so what a free way of following him. You know, he didn't say, do this, do that. You must live here or there. Although, of course, he did kind of send me out to California <laughs> in his own subtle way. But I mean, it's like he guides you totally from within. If you're a mountaineer and you, you're tied by a knot to your guide, you know, the alpine, you know, that knot is everything. You have to hang on with that knot. You know, you're going over this dangerous path. So if you make a false knot with Baba, and you will in the beginning, you have expectations from Baba, uh, but they fall away. And you have to stick to just one expectation, which is not for realization, it's just to serve him and to love him. You know, Adi says, I don't care about realization. Everybody went, oh, I can't believe that. No, because he only wants to serve Baba. That, that's the wonderful example of a Mongoli. They're willing to come back into this gross world just to be with Baba. And uh, I have to say, I feel that too. I mean, I, I've kind of lost all interest in realization. I never had much anyway. Uh, but 
or even hope, you see. <laughs> Baba showed me how hopeless the whole thing was. So it's just him. And that's what hanging on to the Dhamman means. Just concentrate on him. Not on the path, not on disciplines, not on other uh, great spiritual adventures, but just on him. And what does that mean? Obedience and love, humility. And uh, Baba said, humility is worth equally as much as utility. And I think that in Baba work, there are a lot of people who think they're very important doing Baba work. And that's a big illusion. Humility is a lot more valuable to his work. He can do a lot more with someone who's humble and un, you know, unskilled. That's why, well, I'll give you a simple example in doing Baba programs. You think the best person is the best singer or the best speaker or something. And uh, in a worldly sense, it's true. But maybe Baba wants the bad singer and the bad speaker up there, uh, up there mumbling something. Um, because that's important for them. You've got to be very flexible. Where does that mental flexibility come from? That's very important. And uh, I hope us Baba people in the future, when Baba comes again, we're not going to say, oh, he can't be the avatar again. He's not like Mayor Baba. He doesn't wear a mustache. <laughs> doesn't come from Nagar. No. Um, so that's important to, to keep your doors open, your heart open. Although Baba did say very clearly to one of us who questioned why all these brilliant minds of today didn't come to Baba. And he said, it's links of love, it's links of love that, that bring you to me. When he stepped off the plane in 52, he said, it's your love that has drawn me to the West. And of course, that's sort of tongue-in-cheek for the God-man to say, because the love comes from him. <laughs> so he kind of scatters his own love and he gets it back. He would say, I'll go around the whole world just to find one soul who loves me as I ought to be loved. And then we'd all kind of go, well, it's not me. <laughs> you know. But Bob is searching, we're searching, you know, it's a game. He plays his role and we play our role. But behind it all, you know, there's only one actor and one Shakespeare writing the play. And, you know, he's the whole thing. The producer, the actor. Bob has sent a cable to Harold Rudd like that. I am the producer of the whole creation and I play all the roles or something like that. You know, so... You sometimes have to think, well, what am I here for? I'm not really me. I'm playing a role. It's Baba playing this role of Willis Frederick sitting here being interviewed by Wendell. Who's Wendell? He, <laughs> who's Bill? Who's this one or that one? And all of you are going to watch this someday. Who are you? We're all one soul. That was a meditation that Baba gave several times to us. That to meditate, there's only one soul in the whole universe. Yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful cosmic play. Why does it go on and on? And it does go on and on. You know, God never gets bored. I always tell that to people who who get bored. I, I it's one thing I don't care for is people who get bored. <laughs> I have no patience. I have patience with all kinds of people, but not people who get bored. Because it's just too exciting. This world is too exciting. Death is exciting. I'll, I'm going to die pretty soon. I think it's going to be exciting. You know, all that stuff out there. I don't know what I'll experience. And coming back and being a little baby again. You know, it'll be tough, but it'll be exciting. 